And I'll begin by saying I'm thrilled to be here on a Saturday evening for our brother David and afternoon for Gary and myself. Thrilled to be here. We're going to be talking about the canon of scripture, which of course is a spoiler alert. We always talk about that here. And I'm thrilled to be here. We are here with you early. This will be premiering for you early in the morning. It is an apocrypha apocalypse crew premiere. We're going to be talking about Eastern Orthodoxy. And we're going to be doing it uh, in an in-depth, charitable manner and in a fun manner. A lot of really great stuff to talk about. But before we even dig in, I want to greet both of my brothers here and ask, Gary, how have you been, brother? Doing well. Been very busy, but uh, yeah, it's uh, everything's great. Thanks. Definitely. Yeah, David, David, what is new with you? How have you been, brother? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have been great. Uh, winter is still not ending, snowing a little bit <laughs> yeah. here in Czech Republic. Otherwise, or otherwise, everything fine. What about you, William? Everything great. Glad to be back in the thick of everything. Glad to be back home and getting uh, right back into everything and um, preparing for a number of debates, including one that I will be having in a few days, all in Spanish. I'm, I'm, I'm really... Um, uh, digging in this year. I'll be having a Spanish one in, a, in about a week. And then at the end of the month, I'll be having one completely in German. So really looking wow. forward to those, trying to really branch out a lot where I think I, I, I view that I think the people really need a apologetic work being done. And, you know, hope everybody does pray for me when it comes to that. Um, but today, got a great show for the audience. Particularly, we're going to be looking at uh, claims made by... Um, uh, an anonymous individual, uh, Ubi, who, uh, you know, I viewed his video and I thought that uh, there were a number of issues uh, in particular in dealing with the canon. And I think that our friends, our Eastern friends, have these particular issues when attempting to deal with the canon of scripture. And I think that as time goes on, as we dig in more and do more shows and dig into this issue more, people are going to realize that, in my opinion, Really, if you want to come to a true, full understanding of the canon, you're going to have to be Catholic. That really is where everything points to, um, and that where is where it points to historically. And later on, as we do more shows, we're going to find that even the Eastern Fathers uh, were very clear that uh, that's where it points to. And I don't think any of the councils uh, really do our Eastern friends any any favors in, when it comes to this particular dialogue or debate that we have with them. But again, as, as this with everything, we aim to do it in a charitable ma manner. If our interlocutors are not so charitable, that is on their end. Uh, we are, of course, very fervent and very on fire for our faith. But of course, we hope to present things in a, in a very clear manner. Uh, but with that being said, um, you know, I'd like, like to get your thoughts there, David, because I know you have looked very much in depth at the material. I have and um, I know Gary knows the material. Gary knows anything when it comes to the canon. What are your initial thoughts here, David? And when you are ready for me to share the particular incredible slide that you have compiled, let me know. Sure. Uh, so this is basically a refutation of uh, this team called Ubi Petrus, right? They are like orthodox apologists, and they made a video a response to Michael Lofton. Now, this is not going to be like a defense of Michael Lofton or anything like that. It's yeah. just we're re really just addressing the canon because uh, I think they really made some crucial mistakes about the canon. Yeah. Basically, there are two. Their argument is twofold. The first one, uh, for which they basically did not bring up any evidence, is that the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, has no universal canon. That mm -hmm. the various Eastern Catholic churches have additional uh, inspired books in their collection. And the second one is that basically this does not differ by any means uh, from the Eastern Orthodox uh, theology, uh, as well as uh, a very crucial point he's making that uh, Ubi Petrus is saying that mm, the Synod of Jerusalem settled the canon uh, in a means that they settled a minimum uh, collection or minimum number of books uh, and these are binding. So uh, I think uh, this is also not true, but we're going to see more in the presentation. What about your thoughts, Gary? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great way to set it up. Uh, yeah, my impression was the same as yours. Um, yeah, it's very, uh, 
very interesting stuff because uh, we usually don't deal much with the Orthodox canon. It's more Protestant or Jewish canons. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm looking forward to what you have found in terms, because I think this could be very easily refuted from source material, right? Yeah. I mean, this isn't speculating about theology or anything. It, it should say it in the sources. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And um, I think to add to that, I would add that, uh, David, you made a very, very good point that <clears throat> uh, we're not dealing at all. And I want to be very clear uh, in a future video, if we do another video on the very topic, um, we're not doing a particular defense of Michael. Not that we're against Michael either. Uh, I'm going to be very honest. I have not even watched anything Michael has done on the topic. I was shown the video Ubi did, and I know Ubi was replying to Michael. And while he was replying to Michael, I heard the comments he made about this particular issue. That is what we are focusing on. I have no clue what Michael said. I have not watched the videos Michael has done. What we're going to deal with is the robust information we have from historical sources, firsthand source material, church councils, and mega scholars in the field. We're going to delve in and we're going to deal with it. And uh, I think uh, I want to, I think if we clarify that from the very outset, I think we're on a uh, pretty, uh, pretty solid standing. But uh, brother, whenever you are ready, uh, I will share that. In fact, I think it'd be a good time now to add it. There we have it right there. Uh, and it will be a, a lot of fun to be able to delve in and to see. Uh, we're going to look at this incredible presentation David has put together. And as we go through these slides, uh, as, um, as we go to them, we will stop and we'll dialogue and we'll talk about them. Uh, and we recommend the audience, as you're tuning in, you, this may be early for you, maybe you're watching in the afternoon, a day later, two days later, do us a huge favor. For the algorithm, comment down below. Like, share, subscribe if you haven't yet, but comment. Let us know if you liked it. Let us know if you didn't like it. Let us know what improvements we can do. Any comment will help the channel grow and will help with the material that we put out with you and it'll let us know that you're enjoying it. We will be able to produce more material for you. But with that being said, David, definitely dive in because I am thrilled to be able to, to check this out and talk with you about this. Sure. So we're not going to rep uh, reply the video itself. I made a transcript from the video. So we're going to start with uh, with Ubi Petrus's words. It starts at uh, the 1 hour 13 minutes 47 second mark. And basically says, what Mr. Lofton leaves out here is that the Catholic Church also has a debate on what is and is not inspired. Trent only listed the minimum books. It did not put a cap on them, meaning that additional books can be inspired. And for whatever it's worth, various unite, unite bodies usually have additional books in their official Bibles. In our situation, a fairly small number of books, really Revelation, the Prayer of Manasseh, Fourth Maccabees, and Third Ezra's, are in what most Mr. Lofton would consider a position of dispute. But considering that the confession of the city lays down the canon, and considering that the confession has been accepted by all the synods of the church, it is unclear how, if at all, the situation of a narrow canon and the broader canon this differs from the position of the Roman Catholic Church at Trent and the broader canons of many unit bodies. <laughs> uh, so I highlighted the most important parts here. Uh, guys, what do you think about this? The Catholic Church also has a debate on what is and is not inspired. Do you know of anything or anybody who's debating what is inspired within the Roman Catholic Church? <laughs> I'll let Gary take a stab at that, then I'll, 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 I'll uh, give my uh, thoughts on that. Okay. Um, no. Okay. <laughs> William, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> yeah. No, I will add it. Um, I'll, you know what? I'm going to add an emphatic no. There really isn't much else to be able to add to that other than really uh, a, little bit, um, a little bit sloppy there, David. I, I, I don't understand why anybody would make that particular claim. Um, and I think that hopefully he'll do he'll do his homework a little bit better. He's definitely incorrect about that. Yeah, you know, if he would bring up, for example, some the theologian or scholar or anybody who's pointing this out, I mean, okay, I would say he's probably at least has something, but he, he doesn't show anything. So this is very strange, the very first uh, sentence. 
Further, he says uh, that there, is, there are only some just minimum books that trend uh, basically the creed to be inspired. And what I appreciate, at least, from Ubi Petrus, that uh, he basically <laughs> concedes that in their situation, there are some books that are debated, right? So that's highlighted with the green. Okay, let's step forward. So let's address this. He's saying that Trent only listed the minimum books. Is this correct? Now let's look at the decrease of Trent. So Trent basically says that all these books have been handed down as from hand to hand from the apostles. So basically there's a continuity, right? From the apostles till today. When we look forward to the next council, which would be the First Vatican Council, session three, is also this council is also commenting uh, on the Council of Trent. And again, what we see, the uh, Vatican I says, through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, these books have been handed down by the apostles themselves and have thus come to us. So basically, again, we see a continuity from the apostles till today, these books have been handed down. Okay, at the end it says, and as such, they have been handed down. Again, stressing the same thing. Now, when we look at Vatican II, this is crucial. Vatican II, it says, in his gracious goodness, God has seen to it what uh, that what had he had revealed for the salvation of all nations would abide perpetually in its full integrity and be handed on to all generations. And further, the commission was faithfully fulfilled by the apostles who by their oral preaching, by example, and by observance handed on what they had received from the lips of Christ. Basically, in all the councils, what we see that this collection of books what the apostles, the apostles basically had, they handed down to us until this generation. So my question would be, how is Trent and all these councils are leaving uh, the canon open? I mean, if this is the collection that was in its full integrity handed down, then by, by definition, this is a closed canon. I mean, even, even uh, Eastern Catholic scholar, uh, Pentuch, Right, Eugene Pentuch on um, the Old Testament concedes this is the only closed canon we have in Christianity, <laughs> which <Yeah>. is strange. <laughs> Any comments on these guys? Uh, I'll comment and then Gary can uh, follow up if you don't mind, Gary. Um, great points you make there, David. And, and what I particularly like that you are clearly showing is the continuity we have. We have continuity early in the church and we have continuity when you get to Trent and into later ecumenical councils as well, where they're pretty much reiterating was, what was laid down even before Trent. That really is the important thing. And I think the other thing that I would add is that um, I, uh, I'm not aware, and I don't know what a scholar has been making the particular argument that uh, you can go around claiming that the canon is open and other books can be added to it. I wish that would stop though. Um, now, if there is anybody doing that, I have no clue who it would be, because again, I am not privy to any scholar doing that. I'm aware of re recently, uh, Father Coppice has been doing an incredible deep dive into the issue. He wouldn't agree with that either. Uh, and I know Gary and I know David don't agree with that. And we, we dig in, we, we wake up, we have lunch, we have breakfast, lunch and supper. We're always devouring things when it comes to the canon. Uh, and and uh, that really is a little bit of an odd kind of a statement. So, but people that perhaps uh, perhaps is getting that off the internet. Um, but the problem being is they will latch on to something that they hear, and with that they will run with it, and they will uh, make their all kinds of arguments that later on all kinds of books can be added. And even if people are making that kind of an argument, because I have heard people say, well, uh, this this apologist said that maybe later on certain books can be utilized. Well, uh, we, we have no problem with saying, well, maybe later on, if there is a, a reunion, if, if, if possible, if it would ever happen, uh, a recognition of certain books as perhaps very valuable and ecclesiastical, but not canonical. Now, that is something different. We could come to the table with that and, and, uh, and agree that that is a possibility. 
But in terms of the canon being open and books being added later, um, or even perhaps, uh, God forbid, even subtracted, uh, that that really is something that is, is you know, tr was very far from the mind of Trent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just add, uh, just as you just laid out, David, that. Um, for something to be canonical, it has to have a, po a proper pedigree, right? Um, and the thing is, outside of the, the books that are defined at Trent, there really aren't any books that have that proper uh, pedigree that could even possibly even be put into contention as canonical. Um, that's how weak the, the evidence is. So, yeah, uh, William's comments are right on point that, yeah, there, it could be where if reunion is made that there could be toleration of reading of non-canonical books in uh, liturgy or something like that. But uh, I think there would always be a proviso that as long as these books aren't, uh, that there's no insistence that be considered canonical. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, guys, uh, even the Roman Catholic Church uh, occasionally uses some other books, like mm -hmm. uh, I saw uh, like yeah. some material when they utilize, I think, the uh, Apocalypse of Ezra, but it means like they utilize it for prayer or preface or something like that, but not reading on the pulpit as the word of God as we are used to it in the church, right? So, right. Exactly. Not in this manner. Right. Yeah. But uh, why is basically Ubi Petrus saying this? He is uh, pointing out, or maybe just like claiming, that various unite bodies usually have additional books in their official Bibles. Mm -hmm. Now, guys, I was really trying a lot. <laughs> yeah. I spent a lot of time with this, and uh, honestly, I could not find nothing, nothing about no. it. There, there is nothing about it. That's why <laughs> you're, you're, you're right on point, and I know why. I know why that claim comes up. The claim will come up because you have got... Uh, particular saints that are venerated uh, within Eastern Catholicism, such as St. Gregory Palamas and what have you. So then, in turn, our Eastern friends make the mistake of thinking that there are certain Eastern churches that will also um, have a larger uh, canonical set of, uh, of books. But that that is not the case at all. And that, that is a very, um, it's erroneous, incorrect when they uh, assume that there is no evidence of that at all. Yeah. Uh, so I looked at the Codex Canonum Ecclesiarum Orientalium, which is basically the canon law for the Eastern Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. There's a canon law even separate for these churches. Uh, again, I looked through all, all the canons regarding the scriptures, all the time what it says that like uh, it, it basically says the scriptures are divine, they're uh, revelation, they should be used for confirming doctrine, etc., etc like NF 350, uh, that all doctrine should be drawn from revelation, that the sacred scripture be as the soul of all theology. Uh, but never it says that, you know, sacred scripture could defer or these Eastern churches can have their, or collect, their own collection of sacred scripture, nothing like that. It's just always talking about sacred scripture, uh, but he's not making any distinctions. Uh, what is interesting, that Canon 655, for example, says that for liturgical and catechetical purposes, only editions of the sacred scripture with ecclesiastical approval may be used. So again, but what sacred scripture? Sacred scripture is laid down on the Council of Trent. So <laughs> it's not saying anything about the Eastern churches can have their own sacred scripture. So again, when I look through the Codex Canonum Ecclesiarum, nothing, nothing, really nothing. So I chose to contact the foremost expert <laughs> in the, on the canon law of the Eastern Catholic Churches, and that is uh, the Reverend John D. Farris. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'm butchering his name, so I apologize. No, I think you got it right. I think you got it right. <laughs> Yeah, but he's a mega scholar. I mean, just yeah. when you look at his books and his publications, he's incredible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. And so, master of canon law, master of canon law. Exactly. So basically, I asked him: uh, Is there any any uh, Eastern Catholic Church in union in union with Rome uh, whose canon is differing? So they have any additional books or something? And this is what Reverend Ferris wrote. Dear David, I have received your message. The Eastern Catholic churches all have the same canon of the Bible. 
Scriptural text and translations can be used for liturgical purposes only if they have received the approval of Rome. But basically, all the churches have the same canon. So this is what the foremost expert on canon law says regarding the Eastern Catholic churches. <laughs> yeah. Further, I looked into the catechism of the largest Eastern Catholic Church, which is the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Um, and I found a section on the uh, divine scriptures, and basically it lists completely the same, the identical canon, both for the Old and the New Testament. Uh, the only uh, difference is that they separate the letter of Jeremiah from Baruch. So basically there are 47 books of the Old Testament, but in, con in means of content is absolutely Same thing. Yeah. It's identical. Now this is, even this, here we could stop because just uh, imagine. So the Catholic Church uh, received this Eastern Catholic Church to communion. So they come into communion. But before that, before the Eastern Catholic Church came into communion, it was a Eastern Orthodox Church. Is it correct? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So basically they had their like own canon, right? With the, probably with three, third Maccabees or something. Now after reunion, they have the same canon. So I think it would be absolutely unjust from the Roman Catholic Church if uh, it would be necessary for the Ukrainian Catholic Church to change and modify its canon and adopt it to the Roman Catholic Church, but leave the other churches to use their own canon. Would it, would it be unjust? Wouldn't it? Yeah, you're correct. Yeah, so even if we just look at the this catechism, it's obvious that even the other Eastern Catholic churches should have or certainly have the same canon because it would be unjust towards them if they will <laughs> Rome would leave for them the same canon, but the Ukrainians have to adopt the Roman Catholic Church canon. Yeah. Now I also found the uh, website of the Melkit uh, Catholic Church. Again, uh, Bishop is answering the question regarding trend and the Bishop uh, uh, is saying basically that as Catholics, we are bound to all the decrees of the Council of Trent. So <laughs> again, just confirming our position. And the last one, maybe uh, I tried to contact even some bishops <laughs> during my free time. Not everybody responded. I, I, I understand this. But here's, for example, Bishop Philippos Mar Stefanos from the Syro Malankara Catholic Church, which is uh, interesting because they are using the Peshitta, the Syriac translation, not the Septuagint. And again, Bishop uh, Philippos basically just confirmed that even in the Syro Malankara Catholic Church has the same canon of the Bible. Yeah. So so far, what I have been trying and what I managed to, you know, research is just confirming our position. Now, you know. I didn't even have to do this. It was just my <laughs> own research. But basically, the proof, burden of proof is on Ubi Petrus. Uh, did he present any evidence for his claim? Did you find anything, William or Gary, in his presentation or something where he brought up at least one Bible that uh, is approved by Rome and has a different canon or something? No. No. The only thing I can think of, and you're familiar with this, is that um, like, for example, copies of the Latin Vulgate would sometimes have a couple extra books and uh, they would be put into the appendix after Trent. I thought maybe that was what he was referring to. But, you know, that's different than saying uh, that it's uh, canonical scripture, right? Those yeah. are more like uh, 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 historical writings that are beneficial to read, but really nothing more than that. Uh, was that your impression, David? Because when yeah. when I was looking at that quote that you had, that's what immediately came to mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, basically, you're on the same page. I was think about this that maybe the Sira Malankara when they're using the Peshita, since they maybe maybe don't have their own 
like version of the peshita so they would use from the from the orthodox uh, from the syriac orthodox church or something like that but basically yeah <laughs> or, or the septuagint you know um, yeah the, or the septuagint yeah that has more books too but yeah, yeah and the other th thought too david that came up was you know you said it would be unjust for them to be alone you know adopt the, the roman canon but i don't know if you could even establish within orthodoxy that it was that there is a belief in the canonicity of those books outside the ones enumerated at trent yeah. I, I at least some of the orthodox i've talked to they basically said no, they're considered holy writings, but strictly speaking, they wouldn't be considered canonical. So, you know, maybe it wasn't that they forsake, you know, these books. Maybe it was like, yeah, we'll just include the canonical books. Hell, William, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you, you're both incredibly uh, spot on. And let me let me pause for a moment to tell David uh, that you have the, the presentation and the research you have done has been top notch, incredible work. And I want to commend you for that, brother. You've done magnificent work here uh what i would call a uh, top level work and it's very very uh pleased that uh we're able to present this here for the audience here incredible incredible job you've done and i, I echo i agree with what gary and, and david what you both have uh <clears throat> put forth now i have heard that argument utilized about the vulgate before and i think that the problem is it has been utilized without a distinction and I think that is the major issue we have where people will utilize that without realizing what, why, um, why are they placed there? Uh, are they uh, canonical? Are they being considered canonical? I don't think people are doing their research when they use this argument. And, 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 and I'd be very clear and very honest, the other point being that there really is no uniformity on this particular issue within uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, as I, can, I have dialogued on shows I've done who are the Orthodox uh, apologists, where they have no issue uh, affirming the Protestant canon and really not, no issue relegating the others uh, to not even due to a canonical status, but uh, borderline apocryphal status. And then I've dialogued with others that um, would definitely uh, value them uh, and, and view them as being canonical scripture. The problem is, is you, you, you don't have any particular official position. And if people say, well, you know what we do, we've got Jerusalem, uh, well, I would contest that because uh, today you've got a free-for-all on, on a number of issues from Jerusalem. Like, uh, why don't uh, modern-day Orthodox, why did they reject purgatory, for instance? But it was very clearly laid out. Um, almost, uh, look, if, if, if copyrights existed back then, Trent would have slapped Jerusalem with a copyright uh, infringement order with a language utilizer taken directly from Trent, basically, uh, when it comes to purgatory. So uh, it, it really is um, a little bit of an issue of confusion. And when we say that, we do not say that to insult our Eastern friends, but we say that because there is no clarity in this issue. This issue. And it's yet another particular reason why we tell them the door is open. We're waiting for you to come home. <laughs> waiting for you to come home to the fullness of the truth. Um, and when we say that, we say that with all uh, charity in a charitable way. And as we go forward in this presentation, we're going to realize that where do people end up in the end when they are unable to defend their claims on the, um, on the uh, non-uniformity of their canon? Where do they end up? They're going to end up unfortunately, utilizing outdated arguments that Protestants used for a very long time. We're going to find that that becomes all too common. And much like much like um, our Eastern friends, when they contest and stand up against the Immaculate Conception, uh, they utilize Protestant arguments there. You're going to find that they're beginning to do this more and more with the canon, where they're going to hop on over to Jerome and other particular issues. And, you know, good thing here, good thing you're here at the Apocrypha Apocalypse, well, we've covered all that before in previous shows. You're going to want to check out previous shows we've done together, uh, roundtables, and incredible shows that Gary has done as well. Uh, but, brother, uh, I'm sorry for going uh, on a little bit of a rant there. Definitely continue. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you for a compliment. You know, I just can't imagine how people can be confused when they, they hear these things. But, yeah. you know, and, and you really can't find many inf much information about these unite uh, bodies of the church. And so... They could think that you know Ubi Petrus did his homework, but eventually there's no evidence. So, yeah. whatever. So let's continue. 
Further, he, at the 1.22.12 minute mark, he says, there was heavy dispute over the canon in the first millennium, even after Rome, supposedly, Rome 382, supposedly ruled on it. For example, Truo, a council accepted in both the East and, believe it or not, the West, provided a list that differs significantly from those of the synods it so often mentions. Likewise, the numer numerous canons of the various monophysite bodies who rejected uh, Chalcedon and the Assyrian church, which eventually uh, came to reject Carolinian the theology, differed from the canon defined at Hippo 393 and Carthage 397. Uh, we made several videos, right, on the yeah. uh, uh, canon of the Eastern Orthodox Church and specifically on Trullo as well. So guys, check it out or check all the threes out. They're very interesting and there are plenty of things we already addressed. Uh, but as for Trullo, you know, okay, even if they presenting a whole bunch of, you know, lists merged or something like in one canon, uh, what does it mean? I mean, I, I'm not even, uh, when I read uh, this canon from Trullo, you know, uh, I'm not even sure they're saying that you have to accept these as inspired scripture. They say that you have to venerate it, you have to, you know, use them, read them, and etc. But it's not saying that these are the inspired books and now it gives all the different lists. So first, uh, Obi Petrus should prove what it means that this canon on Trullo <laughs> when it gives these lists, because when I read them, I don't know. I, I mean, does it say that uh, these all these books in these different lists are allowed to be read, for example? Maybe. Or does it mean that they can be used for prayers in the church? Well, maybe, of course. But if he wants to make the claim that the 85th Apostolic Canon was in some church used as the official canon list, <laughs> including first and second epistle of Clement, you know, I'm very hesitant to think that <laughs> somebody somewhere ever thought that second Clement was inspired. What about you guys? <laughs> Yeah, no, no, never. No, you're not going to ever find that. And, and I think that uh, the other thing that Ubi has not done, uh, because a lot of it is only available in Greek or in other languages, is looked at actual scholars that were writing right after Trullo, where they're very clear that one and two Clement were not accepted as canonical. There's a lot of information out there. I hear it very often, and I know why. I know why our Eastern friends are going to Trullo. They don't have anywhere else to go to. So they're going to Trullo and they're then claiming, look, we this is where the canon was decided. But when you do that, you know, here, here is a problem without having an authority. This is your problem that you run into. If you're going to adopt Trullo as your end all, this is where the canon was, was decided, you're going to run into a lot of major problems. And when you bring that information to the debate table, you better be ready to, to defend it and you're not going to be able to because we have looked at Trullo. Excuse me. We've talked to a number of scholars that have looked at Trullo and it doesn't bear out at all. Yeah, I don't really have much to add outside of uh, what's been said there. I mean, uh, and yeah, Trullo is the, the only claim to fame that Third Maccabees has. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's just nothing out there. No... No canonical list of individuals, uh, no conciliar list. It yeah. affirms Third Maccabees. It, it's only in the Apostolic Canon 85, which is adopted at Trullo. Yeah. And uh, so I think that's just as much of an outlier as uh, Second Clement as well. Plus, uh, William, of course, uh, we talked about how. Uh, you know, uh, that the apostolic canons is based on a, uh, it's a forgery. It's, uh, no doubt. it's trying to, um, pretend that it's Clement of Rome when it's not. Yeah. And that right there is a major, uh, red flag. And I remember dialoguing with, um, uh, because he's looked at, he's written and he's researched a lot, Father Price on that particular issue. And, and indeed he is confirmed. He said, there's nobody that would argue that it really came from Clement of Rome. And it's very clearly a forgery. There are a number of problems with it. And I've done a whole show with Father Price in this particular issue. There are many problems with that. And if we take that particular position, uh, we're going to run into major issues. And we have found that when doing a show, 
and he's a friend of the channel. He's a friend of mine. I've debated him a number of times, um, but he's a, a near and dear friend, the Reverend Dr. Ramsey. Uh, in my opinion, uh, he is forced to accept uh, very clearly pseudonymous works, and these particular works are very clearly not uh, canonical, but he's forced to accept those particular works. Now, why is he forced to? Because of the problems you run into there at Trullo. So, uh, <clears throat> and you know, even if we look at all these declarations of different popes, uh, what we can see is that there's always some either partial uh, acceptance or, or really there, um, usually it's partial acceptance of Trullo. So, for example, we have Pope Adrian in the 8th century. Uh, he's saying that those alone which are lawfully and divinely promulgated can be accepted uh, from the canons of true law. Uh, Pope Nicholas is usually brought up because there was a council in Constantinople, and I cannot recall the years now, but uh, actually one of the scholars called Nicola Dura says that uh, legates from Pope Nicholas were there, and the canons of true law were discussed, and that eventually probably uh, the canons were reaffirmed or something like that. However, what they usually miss is that Pope Nicholas is one of the very popes uh, who are in favor of the Catholic canon because uh, he is addressing a letter to the, to, to the French or Gallic bishops. And he's saying basically that uh, the decree of Pope Innocent is the one that uh, that is accepted in the church and this uh, is part of the universal canon of the church. So basically, Pope Nicholas would be contradicting himself because, uh, right, because he's saying, no, this canon of Pope Innocent, which is our canon, is the one accepted and decreed, uh, not, not some kind of mixed bag of different lists uh, given at Trullo. Uh, further, Pope John VIII, and we're now almost 100 years after uh, the Second Council of Nicaea, right? And still we have a Pope who's saying that, yes, we're accepting true, but only those that are not contrary to previous canons and decrees of the Holy Pontiffs of this see or to good morals. So again, if previous pontiffs already decreed the canon, <laughs> then of course, if we would look at this mixed bag of different lists as canon, as a collection or different collection of inspired books that would be contrary, of course. But don't believe me. You don't have to believe me. We have scholars again. So the latest scholar I was able to found, uh, find was uh, Esther Brunette, who uh, she did her PhD uh, just on Trullo and the acceptance of Trullo in the West. Uh, it's really just a few years ago she did her dissertation on this. And uh, she also concluded that there was only a partial acceptance. So, acceptatio ne parziale del corpus canonico, right? Uh, and I'm highlighting also the, uh, the, the author, Nicole Dura, who is basically the one uh, who is uh, claiming that the West completely accepted, you know, true law uh, as it was by default. Uh, and even Ubi Petrus has this article on, on his site, so uh, on his website, that's why I'm uh, highlighting it. So uh, Esther Brunet is very aware of this article and she still uh, says, no, there was a partial acceptance. And of course, we know even the, only the first 50 canons were accepted, right? And translated. Uh, so again, Esther Brunet says this would be a contradiction if, uh, if all the 85 canons would be accepted on the West. And uh, again, what, how she concludes that uh, there was only uh, acceptance of Trullo with reservation, uh, approvazione con riserva, and uh, she mentions all these popes, Pope Adrian, uh, Nicholas, uh, Stephen III, uh, John VIII, and even Gregory II. You know, Gregory II was quite in favor of Trullo, but she says even after this, no, Trullo was not accepted as a whole, but uh, we, we see even after him just reservations toward this, uh, this Queen's Council. 
So maybe basically, I'm I'm really not sure what's the point with uh, here with Trullo, <laughs> and you know, both Gary William, you know, Trullo was never signed. You know, all these popes they had you know the can the uh, the list of these canons uh, in their hands. I mean, the canons from Trullo. None of these popes ever signed Trullo. Now Nicola Dura is making a point that basically. This is not a good argument, et cetera, et cetera. That uh, the fact that the signature was not there on these uh, on these scanners makes makes no difference. <laughs> How can he say say this? I mean, <laughs> if it was accepted, then we should see a signature at least of one pope under Trullo. Why don't we see any? Uh, so I'm curious, really. But even if even let's say that okay Trullo, but from an eastern catholic uh, eastern orthodox perspective Trullo is a huge issue <laughs> i mean uh, even nadungat uh, who is brought up even by the eastern orthodox uh, even nadungat says that uh, you know a lot of these canons are not practiced by eastern orthodox church so <laughs> yeah. and and i would really like to see at least one Patriarchate or one church uh, considering first and second Clement as inspired or something. So, uh, but there are more problems, you know, true low. So, you can find in scholarly circles that uh, there are a lot of claims made that true low didn't really like, you know, decree doctrinal canons, but rather disciplinary canons. Which is a which is different because um, you know disciplinary canons are not on the same level as doctrinal. We you, you're not really bind to re, you know receive them, and so for example, even on the Fordham University uh, on their website, they say they say this. Uh, Upon the canons of the council, we must remark that say, that save its acceptance of the dogmatic decisions of the six ecumenical councils, which is contained in the first canon, the council had an exclusive disciplinary character, and consequently, it, if it should be admitted by the particular particular churches, these would always remain on account of their own autonomy, judges of the fitness or non-suitability of the practice, practical application of these decisions. Further, it says that the Easterns have never pretended to impose this code upon the practice of the Western churches, especially as they themselves do not practice everywhere the 102 canons mentioned. So, <laughs> again, so these are all my uh, basically uh, comments on Trullo. I pass it on to you guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you, 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 you bring up a number of very good points there. That being that uh, there's a lot at Trullo that, um, I don't know if it's the correct thing to say, actually, it probably would be, uh, that are lost to history. <laughs> they don't, they're not uh, practiced today uh, by a number of these Eastern bodies. And uh, I think that we run into a problem when you try and cherry pick and say, well, uh, it did define the canon, but, you know, but clearly not the stuff that's pseudonymous. <laughs> you know, how do you... Um, you know, make that kind of a distinction if Trullo itself uh, doesn't make that particular distinction. Well, you have to go later on in the history and read uh, particular scholars that look at the canons of Trullo. But when you do that and you realize it didn't accept these pseudonymous texts, uh, you end up at the doorsteps of a canon that is not representative of what modern day Eastern Orthodoxy hold to. Or really, I can't even say a canon because they really don't even hold to what we would call a canon. Um, it's very odd, and you find yourself, um, there's a big conundrum that you end up with. Okay, uh, so who is correct? Which uh, scholar is correct? The one that says, because um, we have had one on, the one that says, no, you know, one and, two, one and two Clement, they are part of the Bible. Or the one that uh, says that the shorter canon within Protestantism uh, makes a whole lot more sense. Or the one that will say that, no, well, you know what, um, the longer one is correct. Um, three Maccabees is part of it. Um, you know, Revelation's a little bit up in the air, and you know what, uh, the one and Clement, uh, one, two Clement are definitely pseudonymous. You got a lot of confusion there, and there is no solution 
to this mixed bag of confusion at the end of the day, to me, that is a, uh, a major, major problem. Thoughts on that, Gary? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, if uh, if something that approaches a, a pan-Orthodox council like the, the uh, Synod of Jerusalem, you know, isn't followed today, uh, what standing does Trullo have, you know? <laughs> Um, and that's a big problem, like understanding the, you know, where these councils stand and are they universally implemented. When you compare that to the North African councils, and David pretty much listed, you know, like uh, Pope Nicholas I saying that it's a universal law of the church, that uh, innocence list of canonical books, of course, innocent, uh, his list is uh, pretty much identical to the North African councils. Uh, and you could go through throughout history and see that, yeah, there's a much greater uniformity following the North African councils. But things like Trullo are definitely outliers and uh, a bit dubious. And, and like David pointed out, you know, even the language is ambiguous. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I thought that was a really good point, too. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, this, I think, is a very big argument. Uh, Ubi says that the you know, uh, claims that the various monophysite bodies have different canons, right? You know, I think you can use this argument when these monophysite bodies agree on something. For example, on the assumption of Mary. I like to use this because, you know, it's very curious that you cannot find really a church uh, prior to Protestantism that denies the assumption of Mary. <laughs> You know, if if they all agree that Mary was assumed or the, they they believe the Dormition, I mean, this this is telling, right? But if they all have different canons, like the Ethiopians have different canon, the the Syriacs uh, have different canon. I mean, it, it really it's it's not an argument. I mean, even after schism, this church can uh, you know modify their canon, and we will see this is this even happened in Eastern Orthodoxy in the further slides so this only proves my point so i think this is very very weak <laughs> now further uh Ubi petrus brings up rome uh, he basically says that uh, the council of rome in 382 that there is no uh, basically uh, proof that they ever give a list of canonical books and that Demesis uh, decreed this to be inspired or something like that I'm not, not going to, uh, you know, read the whole bunch of this comment. Uh, but he brings up Jerome. He says that Jerome would have known this, right? Because he was assisting Pope Demesis. And yeah, that's a good point. I mean, and still, this is the slide from Obi Petrus' presentation. Still, Jerome basically says that those not in the canon are apocrypha, meaning they should be not used for uh, establishing doctrine, but rather only, you know, they should be just read or something. Uh, first of all, uh, just for the audience, uh, in canonical is in the past, in the time of these church fathers, uh, meant something else than today. So today when we say canonical, it, it is equated uh, to inspired. However, when you look at various church fathers like Athanasius, Rufinus, Origen, they all, all uh, distinguish canonical and ecclesiastical or canonical are those that are read. But basically, they both are inspired, both categories. The difference is that one you can use for establishing doctrine in the church. These are the class ecclesiastical. But when you want to di dialogue with Jews, then basically you need to use the canonical ones. I think you, if you go back to Gary's videos, you, <laughs> he really lays this down uh, with details, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. But basically, Jerome is only suggesting, right? When we look at his preface to the books of Solomon, he's saying that those uh, books that are not received among the canonical scriptures, so that those that are ecclesiastical, uh, let them to be read, but not to establish doctrine. Uh, really, I'm... How to put this? Because Uwe Petrus is saying that Jerome is basically committing a huge sin because he is not following the decree of the masses, if there was a decree of the masses. And therefore, 
uh, this shows that no, there was no uh, list of books decreed in Rome 382, which I think this is, <laughs> this, it doesn't follow simply. Uh, Jerome can suggest a change in the doctrine. I mean, okay, he was interacting with the Hebrews. So he says, hey, look, but really, I think the Hebrews are right. Would you consider this? Really, uh, why would he even, you know, suggest it? So this is one of the points. But even if, even if Jerome knew about Nicaea 1, and he says that the Nicaea 1 already de declared, or at least used, the book of Judith as sac sacred scripture. So, <laughs> so yeah. uh, he was, if Jerome was going against Nicaea 1, so what? So he can go against Rome 382, no? I mean, <laughs> I don't yeah. see a difference here. So if, if, if Jerome conceded that Nicaea 1 counted the book of Judith as inspired scripture, okay, so why would he not go against Rome 382? I really don't see, see this argument. But further, even Jerome tells us that there was a council in Rome during his era, and even under uh, the Pope Damasus. We see this in letter uh, 127, paragraph 7. We see this explicitly in letter uh, 126, in paragraph 7, when he says that he was helping Pope Damasus, the Bishop of Rome, uh, with his co ecclesiastical correspondence and writing his answers to the question referred to him by the councils of the East and West. And that basically uh, Paulinus, uh, the Bishop of Antioch and Epiphanius from Salamis, they all gathered in Rome. So we can at least say that there was a council in Rome. We, this doesn't really, this is not an evidence that they decree the canonical list. Uh, however, we can say, okay, there was a, there was a council. But where are the records from this council? So where are the decrees? Where are the canons? There should be at least something. No? So I really don't have, I don't really, uh, I don't know why should I doubt that <laughs> those decrees are spurious and they're not original, which are uh, containing also the list uh, of the canonical books. But you know, here's another thing. Jerome did not sin or did not commit a sin against uh, the Pope, because eventually he's, he submitted his view to the Pope, right? Yeah. He says to Demetrius that hold fast to the faith of saintly innocent, the spiritual son of uh, uh, Anastasius and his successor in the apostolic see, and do not receive any foreign doctrine. So you will find the truth at the Pope, at Pope Innocent, who, by the way, decreed that the Deuterocanon and basically all the books that are listed in Hippo, Carthage and Rome are canonical and inspired. Further in his correspondence to uh, Rufinus, he says, what sin have I committed in following the judgment of the churches? The churches choose to read Daniel in the version of Theodosian, right? Mm -hmm. Which would include uh, the literal portions of Daniel. So uh, again, clearly Jerome eventually accepted these books. And I highly recommend checking out also Gary's video on Jerome, where he basically uh, also, I think you present Breen's book and you suggest that, uh, that to look at Breen's book uh, on Jerome's quotations from the Deutero canon. So towards the end of his life, he's quoting them extensively as scripture, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's far about Jerome. Many comments, guys? Yeah, what I'm doing right now is I will um, <clears throat> I will also, by the time this does air, uh, down below, I will have a link where people can get a hold of why Catholic Bibles are bigger and the case for the Deuterocanon Canon and any other book Gary uh, has written. I definitely recommend people get a hold of those books if you want meaty theological information on this topic and delve into all of the shows that we have done here. I, I think that your point, um, David, is a great one. So we went through St. Jerome. Uh, basically heard a lot of the arguments that within Protestantism are used against Jerome all the time. He is a very uh, popular uh, uh, beating stick that they utilize in order to to oppose the Deuterocanon. And, and, and as I brought up before, I have heard um, every argument under the sun utilized by Protestants. We've uh, been dealing with them for uh, a very long time, Gary and myself. And now, today, they're being rehashed now uh, by the Eastern Orthodox. They are 
uh, unfortunately for them, we, we've been aware of them for a long time. So there are rehashing arguments that have been answered already. But uh, Jerome is a very popular one. Uh, so now they're hopping on over to Jerome to hope that that will cause a little bit of confusion and it'll pretty much uh, tell their followers and their audience, look, okay, there's confusion even in Jerome, everything's going to be okay. But <laughs> you don't get to the, they don't read the portion where, uh, as we've, we've covered in various shows, the great St. Jerome does submit his view to the great Pope, St. Innocent. Um, and that is important because as we pointed out before, and I will uh, hand over the, the, the keys to Gary for his thoughts, as we pointed out before, uh, Pope Innocent, say, uh, Pope St. Innocent, uh, was a very clear defender of the Deuterocanonical text. Isn't that right, Gary? Yeah, in fact, uh, the bishop that uh, requested an answer on the canon was a patron of Jerome. Yeah. So uh, so there is even like, he's he wants clarification because mm -hmm. he's reading Jerome's prophecies about these books being apocrypha and the Pope answers. And like David pointed out, Pope Nicholas I, basically says the innocent is a universal law of the church. And so here you have letter 130 where it proves Pope uh, Nicholas was correct. It was universal because it included even Jerome, yeah. you know, well, ultimately. Yeah. Great, great point. Now, this is the last section. So again, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, you can read it for yourself when you pause yeah. it. But basically, Ubi Petrus is saying that... Uh, so if Rome in 382 decreed the canonical lists and this was like, you know, binding or something, or uh, why then the councils of Hippo and Carthage and again reaffirming and why do we need again the, uh, the approval of the Pope? Uh, so he concludes the answer is that the council had never heard of the list supposedly produced by Rome in 382. Well, <laughs> so he says, even then, why would the council in Carthage ask for the Roman Synod's approval on a canon that was identical to one already co codified by Rome? Well, I can ask the same question. We could ask, uh, why was Carthage 419 reaffirming the same books <laughs> of the canon again, if it was already settled in previous council and papal decrees? Well, this is not undermining anything. I mean, nobody doubts that Carthage 419 gives a list of can can canonical books. Nobody doubts that Carthage 397 gives a list. Nobody doubts that Hippo 393 gives a list. They're just simply reaffirming. This is not an argument against Rome. <laughs> um, I don't know if you uh, understand this, uh, basically, oh, yeah. this argument. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do, and I, I am baffled how uh, how anyone would, uh, or I'm not aware of anybody that would make the argument that Rome 382 uh, was even remotely ecumenical. Uh, just baffled by that, definitely. Definitely. Um, but a great point, Sir David. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, in my books, I, I downplay uh, the Council of Rome because yeah. it, it is an open question whether or not what we have here is a document of the Damasus apart mm -hmm. from the Council or part of the Council. Sure. Uh, most modern scholars, like uh, you know, um, the latest Denzinger, for example, in their introduction, places that as a decree of Damasus. So I think scholars yeah. are moving that this was a papal statement on the canon. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, your your points are spot on. I mean, it's uh, the church uh, has to reaffirm things in different yeah. locations, and that's how you bring about a standard of uniformity is by local you know, synods and so on, adopting uh, the norms of the church. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if that argument is true, then what about Carthage 419 and, yeah. and uh, Carthage 393 or 392 for that matter? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I didn't really understand why is, you know, wasting us so much time with this. I mean, this yeah. is another issue. Even if, three, even if Rome 382 didn't decree the canonical, so what? We have, yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah. Just a few years after that, several other coun councils. Yeah, but whether whether it was a council itself or a papal decree, uh, it still follows that it could be reaffirmed at later councils, and we have that yeah. throughout history being done. Uh, yeah. So your your point, either which way, David stands, and it stands uh, very firmly. Sure. 
But just to give you a little review here, for mm -hmm. for example, C.H. Turner, great scholar, says this is uh, authentic. I'm in Rome 382. Yeah, you get you get Chapman. The best manuscripts uh, also attest that Rome 382 decreed uh, decreed these uh, books to be canonical. Jurgens, uh, he says it's authentic. Uh, we got question from Patrology. Uh, actually, it's true that there are like five sections from of uh, of the Decretum Galasium, and but question says the first three are genuine. And the uh, second one includes also the canonical list. So again, no issue here. Uh, we got Leonard very, uh, very recent from 2016, basically. He says, again, Synod of Rome was the first one to use the term canonical in reference to those books which were included in the broader list of Carthage. So a bunch of bunch of scholars. I mean, certainly you can find here and there scholars disagreeing, like Hogarth, for example, Sir Henry Hogarth. Uh, but okay so what i mean <laughs> this really this really isn't an issue so uh, basically this was obi's uh claim that uh against against us and then he says that the confession of those cities and the synod of jerusalem is basically binding for all eastern orthodox and uh it's basically settled the canon but he says it settled a minimum list. Well, so he says the proto canon and also the Deutero canon is settled, and then you can have some additional books like I don't know uh, the Apocalypse of Ezra, like the Russians have, and etc. But these are not mandatory. But they all have to accept the Deutero canon. He says it's a minimum that needs to be that it, this is binding. Okay. By the way, I wanted to attach the picture of uh, Cyril Lucaris there. <laughs> because, uh, Very fittingly. Because the Patriarch of Alexandria in 2009, 2009 uh, canonized him. So he's a saint for the Alexandrians. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. the Sitius says he's, uh, he's, he, he basically uh, ignorantly and rather maliciously called these books uh, Apocrypha and all these the Deutero canon and the Proto canon, they are canonical and they are sacred scripture. Okay, let's see if this is true. So, Saint, Saint for the Russians and some of the Eastern Orthodox, Saint Philaret of Moscow. So his catechism says that, uh, no, the Deutero canon is not, <laughs> not sacred scripture. In fact, if you look at his catechism and uh, questions 31 to 34, he says that only those that you know were written in Hebrew or the Jews accept that's that's canonical. The rest is not. Uh, he reaffirmed this uh, also in his draft curriculum in uh, 1814, when he says the most apocryphal books, that is those of which the higher origin is close, contain many pure and important thoughts, and therefore not without reason are included in the number of sacred ones and are worthy of full attention. All uh, holy scripture must be read in the course of an academical course. So this is in 1814, and then we have also Another one published in 1821, he says uh, on the so-called apocryphal books, that on the status of the apocryphal books of St. Filler, Filleret wrote very streamlined. In addition to the books of the Old Testament, so these are addition, which are in the Jewish composition of the Holy Scriptures, there are also uh, whole books and some passages attached to the inspired, so these are attached to the inspired books in the Greek and other ancient lists. So clearly it makes a distinction between inspired, so the proto-canon, and the not inspired, the deutero-canon. Uh, you know, I think Russians were the one also who signed the Synod of Jerusalem, the Acts of Synod of Jerusalem. They were the first ones, I think, if I'm not uh, mistaken, but I really, uh, I can be mistaken on this, but I think they're the one of, one of the first ones. Further, we have other, uh, like Metropolitan Macarius. Uh, wow. He says, although they are useful in, and instructive, but they are not among the sacred books. So again, the Confession of Dositius says what? It says that these are sacred books. No, Metropolitan Macarius says, no, they are not sacred books. And they are not among this collection. 
Uh, further in the uh, 19th century, we have uh, Nikolaevich uh, Alexandrovich Astafiev, uh, chairman of the Society for the Distribution of the Holy Scriptures in Russia. He says, uh, uh, Astafiev, is that uh, he did not know the term non canonical books and uh, he used the term apocryphal books. So he's very explicit that these books are apocryphal. Nikolai Nikonarovich uh, Gubovsky. Uh, Gary, you have the book from Downey, right? Uh, it's the use of the apocryphia, apocryphia yeah. in the Christian yep. church. So mm -hmm. Globowski uh, wrote a review on this book. It was beginning the 20th century. And this is what he admits uh, on the problems associated with understanding the Old Testament canon in Russian theology. He says, we find ourselves right in a strange position, arguing even about the canonicity of non-canonical non books and the non-canonical nature of canonical ones, <laughs> and bring in the purest apocrypha, which is third as dress for them. Third as dress for them is the, apoc uh, the, apoc uh, uh, the apocalypse of Ezra, just to right. be correct. So <laughs> basically, he says, even in the beginning of the 20th century, we are confused. We, we, we don't even know what is scripture. <laughs> so the confusion, uh, just to be clear here, uh, there is no clarity. You know, it's, it's, it's st still in, um, there might be this idea within certain pockets of orthodoxy there, well, they'll, they will act as if, while well, this was settled at Trullo, uh, there has been uniformity for the longest period of time, there has not been any confusion. Uh, but everything, everything that we've been examining, there, there has been confusion. And in, in my mind, there is anything but uh, something settled when you can utilize Third Maccabees as a canonical text and uh, really go against what the ancient councils particularly hearken to. Uh, you have a big problem there. That, that, that's just one little example there. I, I think that's problematic. Yeah, that's a great pickup too, by the way, David. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the fact is that this term, what the Russians use, non-canonical books for the Deuterocanon, it became commonly used only after the second uh, edition of the Bible by the Moscow Patriarchate in 1968, uh, where an appendix was also attached to this Bible. And this appendix says that there are canonical and non-canonical books in the Old Testament. The main difference between them is that the canonical books are more ancient, written in the 15th to the 5th century BC, and non-canonical books that is not included in the canon in the collection of the sacred books mm -hmm. were written later in the 4th to the 1st century BC. So again, even in 1968, we have a, you know an appendix uh, to the Russian Bible saying that these are, these, is, these are not sacred scripture, you know, the Deuteronomy the canon. We have Pomazansky, uh, another theologian from uh, who wrote the book Orthodox Dogmatic Theology. And uh, again, I'm not going to read the whole bunch of it, but uh, I highlighted the most important part. Certain of these books, the non-canonical ones, are so close in merit to the divinely inspired books that, for example, in the 85th Apostolic Canon, the three books of Maccabees and the book of Joshua, the son of Sirach, are numbered together with the canonical books. Again, why they have to be so close to the inspired books. <laughs> this again just says they are not inspired. They may be styled, you know, or written uh, that they gives you an impression, impression that they are so close, but basically they are not inspired. And this wow. is a very recent publication again. So again, if the confession of the Sitius is, is settling the canon, the minimum books, and saying that the Deutero canon is inspired scripture. Again, why do we have the Russians rejecting it again, again, and again? So over yeah. and over again. But Uwe Petrus can say that, you know what? The Synod of Jerusalem became binding only after all the churches signed it. And he basically argues that this happened only in 2016. Uh, on the Council of Crete, when those churches, which uh, till that time didn't sign it, eventually in 2016, they were all, there were all the signatures. So in 2016, all the churches of the Eastern Orthodox churches signed the Synod of Jerusalem. So only since 2016, it's binding for everybody. 
maybe he can use this argument. I don't know if he is appealing to this or not. I'm not sure. The problem is, even today, when you look at the Russian Bible Society, it simply denies, like, explicitly that the yeah. 11 non-canonical books are not divinely inspired. This is the fact. I mean, and uh, when you look at the group uh, and the stuff of the Russian Bible Society, of course, you have Protestants there as well. But the vice president is the priest of the Russian Orthodox Church and act acting as a rector of the Church of the Assumption of Blessed Virgin Mary in Moscow. Doctor of Theology. Yeah. Doctor of Theology and famous biblical scholars. Wow. Yeah. You have... And, and, and David, as you pointed out, uh, let, me, let me just hop back really quickly. As you pointed out right here, there is no ambiguity there. That is a, a blanket uh, rejection. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. So my question for Ubi Petrus is, okay, if the Synod of Jerusalem is binding, how come the Russians are still rejecting these books as divinely inspired? So yeah. either, either you can say that, okay, they're binding, but the Russians are just, you know, rejecting it, but they have no tools to somehow <laughs> convince the Russians otherwise. <laughs> that is the key thing, David. Yeah. I think you, you, your key point there is that um, he, very, he, he will come back and he will say, well, you know, you have all sorts of um, instead of a contest and rad trads that go against uh, Catholic teaching. Um, how do you point to them being wrong? We can point to them being wrong because we have a catechism and we have documents from our ecumenical councils, but you clearly do not have that kind of a, an ability to point to something to say, okay, this is this shows us where we can go for our definitive, uh, to definitively settle this manner on the canonical controversy within Eastern Orthodoxy. There is nothing there um, even remotely similar. And I think that is way... That is why I mentioned earlier um, that you can you'll run into statements like this where they can freely deny the canonicity of these books. And this is a big problem if councils that they hold to very clearly hearken to those earlier uh, synods where they had the deuterocanonical books as canonical scripture. And as you pointed out earlier, uh, if you don't want to use the word canon, fine we realize many early fathers used canon in a different manner we mean sacred scripture and the problem at the heart of the issue is they ultimately have an issue with identifying what is sacred scripture and what is not sacred scripture we don't have that problem and i think that's a massive massive issue and um in my opinion uh even uh, an even greater reason to uh to be catholic i'd love to get your thoughts on that gary yeah, no, uh, well said. You know, I, I I was just sitting thinking, do we have any evidence of the Russian Orthodox like officially repudiating the Synod of Jerusalem? Because they do have their name on the document. I mean, that right. seems pretty certain. Yet they just kind of drift off. And, and, you know, that actually, for me, it, it's it's worrisome because are we ever going to achieve unity if, for example, if we ever have like another ecumenical council of Nicaea and re reunite with various Eastern Orthodoxies, they're going to sign on the dotted line. But who's to say, you know, they're just going to follow that and continue? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, th because look at uh, even their own synod of Jerusalem. Uh, they fell away on something as pivotal as what's the word of God? And, and you know, issue. guys, this really started in the 18th century in Russia when, you know, scholarship, uh, through scholarship, they started to research the canon some way. But previously, you don't see these things. You don't see them rejecting it. Uh, or I, at least I wasn't able to find any, you know, pedigree for this in Russia, rejecting the usual canon. Hmm. So I think this is another <laughs> evidence that even after schism, these churches, Churches can alter the canon. They can. So uh, arguing with the monophysite bodies, that's not an argument. Your own churches alt alter the canon. Unfortunately, I mean, this is really sad because they, they are really on par with the Protestants. Uh, I mean, what's the difference, really? <laughs> They're yeah. similar to the earliest reformers who included the, uh, the Deuterocanon in the Bible, yet they denied their inspiration that this is the 
this is ex exactly the same thing. Yeah. And, 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 and one thing, ahead, ahead, if ahead. I can throw it in really quick, one thing Definitely. to point out too is uh, the Theodoret Catechism. This was done by the influence of Reformed Protestants evangelizing in Russia. So we do have like a causal link that their opinions were that they basically adopted uh, the views of these Protestant missionaries, just like with Cyril Lucas, you know, same thing. He, he uh, uh, brought uh, Protestant doctrine into the other orthodoxies. So I just want to throw that out. Good that was point. A great point. Good point. Yeah, great, great point. And, and to add to that, um, David, you're, you're, you're correct. Uh, as, as we notice, uh, more and more our Eastern friends um, move further away from um, apostolic continuity in terms of this particular issue. Uh, the canon, we have seen it with purgatory, which shockingly they uh, very, very clearly affirmed at councils they hold to. They, uh, today they have an issue with that, despite uh, even the language of their very, their very own Saint Mark of Ephesus affirming it. Uh, and even when it comes to uh, the Immaculate Conception. So we see a number of issues there. And uh, even though uh, I'm glad that here on the Apocrypha Apocalypse, we are focusing on the canon as far as I'm aware, and nobody else is doing this particular work of uh, looking at the issues within Eastern Orthodoxy and the canon. I, I am glad we are. And uh, I, I want to emphasize again, before we finish the show, for the audience tuning in, uh, how can you help us out? You can help us by liking, sharing, subscribing, and also realize that the algorithm massively is impacted if you leave a comment. I don't care if you only put a thumbs up or whatever, leave a comment down below. The video will be viewed by more more people will realize the video is there and it will go a long way to helping us get the word out there when it comes to the ancient apostolic canon of scripture and it'll help us reach more people. Yeah, yeah. Well put, William, well put. <laughs> so, and you know, what I would ask the Russians, well, how is this their theological uh, theology compatible with the previous ecumenical councils? For example, we have the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus, right, 431, which uh, in its uh, letter to uh, in its letter to Pamphylia uh, says, "For as much as the divinely inspired Scripture says." do all things with advice. Here, the Council of Ephesus explicitly states that Sirac is divinely inspired. I mean, how can you get more explicit than that? So, you know, because I think these Russian theologians and uh, these scholars and these bishops and uh, metropolitans, when they looked at all these basically lists of different church fathers, they will say, well, you know, even Athanasius made a distinction between the canonical and ecclesiastical ones, even Rufinus, even Origen, et cetera, et cetera. But they missed the very important point that they, that they regarded both groups as inspired. And if it wouldn't be that, then how could be Ephesus claiming that Sirach is divinely inspired? So basically, Gary, what you did all the time in this uh, channel, it's just affirming <laughs> that none of those lists are making a distinction between the inspiration uh, in regards of inspiration from the canonical and the ecclesiastical. So really the Russians, I don't know how they tackle with this. Very tough. Uh, it's a very tough issue to tackle. And I don't think that they, um, look, maybe Maybe in five or 10 or 15 years, they will uh, try to develop um, uh, some kind of clarity when it comes to this. But thus far, I don't, I don't see any, any solution in sight for them. Uh, and I see people more and more realizing that to be an issue and more and more realizing that uh, really, if you want clarity and particularly on the issue of the canon, uh, you're, you're coming home to the, to the Catholic Church. <laughs> That's pretty much what I have visibly seen people realizing more and more. And also Second Nicaea, I think uh, it also utilizes Sirach yeah. and the Book of Wisdom as inspired scripture. So basically all these ec ecumenical councils held these books as inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just an addition here that basically the Russians include also, as I said, the Apocalypse of Esdras. We would call it 4 Ezra, but the Russians call it 3rd Esdras. 
Uh, basically, again, they don't consider it canonical, but yet they include it in the Bible properly. Yeah. So this is just another proof against Tobi Petrus. You can still have a Bible <laughs> with not, not inspired book in it. You can use it in the liturgy. Still, uh, it, wouldn't, it, it is not making it inspired because, you know, the Russians use all these books in the liturgy. But they are really clear that for them it's not inspired. So... Yep. But so why is this important? Of course, <laughs> the canon determines the deposit of faith, right? Scripture yep. and tradition. So you have to know your scripture. If you don't know your scripture, you don't know the deposit of faith. Yep. And unfortunately, I just, uh, this is just for fun here. So I'm, I'm not trying to mock here anybody, uh, certainly not Jay Dyer, but when you look at these two videos uh, I present here, uh, when here, he is basically attacking the Protestants and he is confronting Protestants. Uh, yeah. You know, he says, how do you know the Gospels are inspired? You know, how do you know your books in your Bible are inspired? Because you don't have apostolic tradition. You have, you don't have, you don't have the church, etc. We were here all the time. Yes, uh, that's true. I would certainly use these arguments. But, I, but you cannot use these arguments as Eastern Orthodox because no, you, cannot. you have to face that you have different traditions, you have different canons, which really underscores the credibility of Eastern Orthodox in this way because, okay, the Protestant can also ask, okay, but which tradition is correct then, right? The Russian, the Greek one, and the Russians, they're the majority of Eastern Orthodox. That's the largest church. So uh, really, and by the way, Jay Dyer is appealing to Trullo again, but I don't know whether he knows that no. <laughs> the 85th Apostolic Canon includes first and second epistle of Clement, right? So if no. he thinks that. Uh, so problems, problems, problems again. But, you know, some bishops were really like sane and they knew that this is a problem. So we have from Oikonomos Elias uh, uh, in his publication, the significance of the deuterocanonical writings in the Orthodox Church. And he says that basically uh, in, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know which year, but uh, Metropolitan Chrysostoma of Mira stated that the Orthodox Church must determine in the holy and great sin of the authority that it, att it attributes to these books. So some, at least some bishops and some metropolitans are aware of this problem. And I think I really appreciate yeah. that they try or at least would like to somehow solve this problem. Yeah, see, I had to laugh because without looking at your footnote, I recognize the typeface as coming from the Apocrypha and Ecumenical perspective. I actually knew the book <laughs> just by looking at the print. Man, <laughs> I, I got to take a break from this stuff. No, you're doing great work on it. You can't take a break. You're doing it. That, that's, I, I, I didn't recognize it. I had to look at um, the footnote to see where that came from. Yeah, I mean, I, I, Gary, is there a book you don't know about? Uh, I, don't well, I, I don't know if I don't know, but uh, <laughs> you're helping me catch up to speed, though. Great point, though. Uh, and, you know, I think this is something that we should encourage our um, brothers and sisters in orthodoxy, that this is a problem that needs to be solved. Yeah. And, you know, the, the closest thing you get to the Council of Trent in orthodoxy is really the Synod of Jerusalem. I don't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any other council which all the patriarchs signed on and there was that much uniformity as far as, you know, producing a declaration. It's just the problem is that people are following uniformity. it. Yeah, apparent yeah, uniform. Apparent uniform. You're right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So the conclusion is for Rubri Petrus that basically the Catholic Church has one universal canon of scriptures, regardless on the liturgy and the different Eastern Catholic churches. And um, basically it didn't give any evidence that for for the contrary. And of course, uh, we have a definite decision by Trent with the full anathema. So, and this is this, they just basically accepted the same list as was presented in the Ecumenical Council of Florence, which was a strive for reunion, right? So mm -hmm. the Roman Catholics ex uh, basically 
expected the Eastern Orthodox to accept this list, right? <laughs> so, yeah. because Florence was a strife for a, a reunion, and um, yeah, that was long before um, this, this um, long after the Synod of uh, Jerusalem, too. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, after I think it no, was before it was before. Be I meant before. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So there was this anticipation hundreds of years before even the Synod of Jerusalem. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, correct. And of course, we have to conclude that there is not one Eastern Orthodox canon. Unfortunately, there are different canons. And uh, unfortunately for Ubi Petrus as well, basically the Russians accept only the 66 uh, canon of the Protestants. So um, you have a problem here. So even if he will say that Synod of Jerusalem is binding for all, but still, I mean, how can you, how can you make the Russians accept it? <laughs> or so, yeah. I think so, those are, were, were fantastic, fantastic points, David. I think that uh, you really, really um, set forth a fantastic presentation. Now, uh, that is a, a, a major issue that uh, we didn't have any evidence presented by, by Ubi. That is one thing I noticed. Um, you hear a lot of things, there's really no evidence presented. But uh, you're correct about that when you point out that about Trent. One other thing that I would add is that for them, for, for, for Orthodox that are on the fence, uh, or for those that are firmly Orthodox and, and that reject these books, uh, like many do, uh, their great Saint Mark of Ephesus uh, accepted the Deuterocanonical text, utilized two Maccabees in particular in his dialogue uh, against the Catholics. Um, and you've got, uh, and, and particularly they probably don't know about this because the massive majority of Orthodox, um, uh, at least online ones, uh, have never read uh, Saint Gregory Palamas, but he utilizes the Deuterocanonical text and he utilizes them very often as well. So. If you've got great Eastern figures, great saints, great fathers utilizing them as being holy writ, as being sacred scripture, uh, for those people that reject them, I think they need to look at them again uh, and really examine how they were utilized, how they're hearkened to in the Bible, and how they're used by the early ch church fathers. And for those that do believe that they are uh, biblical, but are utilizing uh, other books as well that were never accepted in any of these um councils or or really dropped off the radar of the radar of the early church fathers um I, I think they really need to examine the historical evidence and um there's an issue there and it's an issue that unfortunately until they become catholic they're not going to be able to resolve yeah yeah You're basically i think ahead, the, eastern, the eastern orthodox is uh, at least from the perspective of the canon they're same like the oriel oriental orthodox that these different churches can have different canons, basically. Yeah. Your uh, your concluding thoughts uh, on uh, on this, Gary? Yeah, boy. I mean, you guys said it all. I I don't know what more I could possibly add. I mean, uh, David, this was an outstanding presentation, and uh, your final points and your conclusion, I think, are spot on. And uh, yeah, uh, I think it really does highlight um the the need for unity you know amongst the churches okay. i mean if you can't agree on the word of god um you know uh what hope is there on anything else yeah 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 great great points anything uh any concluding uh thoughts there on on, on this david or any thoughts in particular uh nothing particular i hope uh you guys enjoyed it and also the audience and as you said william <laughs> i ask everybody if you liked it just like it subscribe share and please support both william gary and we're trying to do the best we can <laughs> yeah. thank you definitely yeah and we really thank you audience we really really greatly thank you for tuning in um again as we repeat it over and over it'll help the algorithm a whole lot please uh comment down below we greatly appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. And we will be back together. Pray for us. Pray for Gary and his uh, wonderful family, David's wonderful family, my family. 
pray for us to remain healthy and be able to bring you a whole lot more material in 2023 and God willing beyond. Everybody, thank you for tuning in. Make sure to hit like, share, subscribe, leave a comment. And brothers, I look forward to being back with you all in the future. God bless you. And I had a great time dialoguing with you all. All right. Thanks, William.